Philadelphia. You're listening to WPPMLP Philadelphia 106.5 in the 215. Thank you so much for joining us, and you're listening to the What's Next radio show and Ray's Latino Talk podcast. The podcast don't stop, never stops. This is the podcast home for the realest conversations and analysis on politics and today's hottest topics from a diverse perspective. This is your host, Ray Collazo, and returning back to co-host today's show, speaker, author, and entrepreneur, Dionelli Reyes, welcome back. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be back here at WPPMLP 106.5 FM in Philadelphia at your talk show. And I'm going to be discussing gaslighting. Well, she's always very exciting. Dionelli brings a lot to the table. I was actually, you know, people knew you had a great authority as it relates to gaslighting, Dionelli. But you brought so much with the political conversation, so impressed, so dynamic. And it's like a ticket to the say lineup here. We got so many powerful wi- Dominicans that come on the show. Much respect to our Quisqueanos and, and all of our great uh, co-hosts and collaborators, Yashira, Chrissy. We have so many strong people that are part of this family. You first heard Dionelli a few weeks ago discussing her book, Delayed But Not Denied 3, Real People Sharing Stories About Healing and Growth. Dionelli gave us a master's class on how gaslighting impacts our personal relationships and politics, and Dionelli was a smash hit, so we had to have her back. Later in the show, we will decode AOC's latest appearance at the National Action Network. Go broke, stacking more 20s. Man, these Democrats are, are, are thinning out my wallet, let me tell you. In the, the debut of our Gaslighting OK segment, Dionelli will analyze if Attorney General Bill Barr is gaslighting America. Very interesting. I just want to go over real quick just the definition of gaslighting, and it's an insidious form of persistent manipulation and brainwashing that causes the victim to doubt her or himself and ultimately lose her or his own sense of perception, identity, and self-worth to the point where he or she must rely on the gaslighter for a sense of reality. So gaslighting can occur in personal relationships, at the workplace, or over an entire society through politics. So so we haven't had a chance to talk to the Ray Talk Show family about the fallout of Latina political figure Lucy Flores' announcement that former Vice President Joe Biden invaded her personal space at a campaign event in 2014. It is important, and for people that want to hear sort of my, uh, I did do a monologue on the audio version of Ray's Latino Talk podcast, audio only, that I had featuring um, Planetary from Outer Space talking about the legacy of Nipsey Hussle, much respect to Nipsey. Mm and uh, talking about some other political headlines. So I, I did, but I thought it was a, a important for us to have a conversation entre la familia, especially our, our women voices, to have this conversation because it has a lot of implications around politics, but even, I think, more importantly, how people understand and respect each other's space. So, Dionel, let me start by asking you, what, what is your take as a Latina that's advocating for the rights of women and, and for people to, uh, and for healthy relationships, ultimately, What's your take on the public conversation that's uh, taken place post Lucy Flores' announcement of this awkward, needless to say, very awkward moment she had with Vice President Biden? Well, I think that a, a lot of people are just questioning the timing of it, of her announcement. Like, why are you talking about it now when it happened back in 2014? And but. It's important to talk about it, and it's important for us as women to establish our boundaries. Like, no, that's not okay. You know, you're absolutely right. Do you think a lot of women, you know, I think there was a lot of, I have some thoughts on this, but I want to get yours first. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of miscommunication and a lot of uh, uh, different cultures clashing here. I think there's a generational conversation Mm -hmm. that this brought out, regardless of anything, just you know, you're talking about a, a very elderly baby boomer as compared to a millennial woman. You're talking about uh, culturally, you know, sort of like a, a powerful Irish American man that, you know, basically has a, a different way of, of, of holding himself accountable than than certainly people of my generation, our generation. And, and, and there's a, a cultural element as, as a Latina who's trying to make her space in the world oftentimes. I mean, this is a woman who ran for lieutenant governor once. I mean, this is someone that um, has been in the uh, Nevada State Assembly, has run for Congress, um, is a nationally known uh, political figure. And so oftentimes being in a space where she's maybe the only woman or one of the few people of color and, and her wanting to make sure her space is respected. So uh, what do you think that that was part of this dynamic in terms of uh, a lot of miscommunication, but ultimately there needs to be a respect for Lucy's uh, 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 space? <laughs> Absolutely. And then something that she mentioned was that 
It's the dynamic, the power dynamic, how she felt that he was way more powerful and she was almost powerless compared to him. And she didn't feel um, empowered and she to actually speak up and say, you know, I'm not comfortable with this. And she also didn't expect it because she says we didn't have that kind of relationship. You know, that hit on a very good point because there was a lot of I was, you know, quite honestly, I was really disappointed um, because. You know, if you want to say, well, maybe the timing's questionable. How come she never talked to him directly? She's a Bernie Sanders supporter. I'm not even sure if that's the case now. I know he's he supported her in the past for her political stuff. But, you know, I was very disappointed because I feel there was a double standard happening throughout this conversation. And I think this is the bottom line. We're talking about culture, right? Mm-hmm. Dominicana, Boricua. We have, you know, we're very, there's no, no group warmer and more affectionate than the Caribbean Latino community. We, you know, kiss on the cheek and just say, hello, I have hug, abrazos, warm, touchy-feely people. But the bottom line is this. This same warm and touchy person and this same warm and touchy person that we're about affection and everything else. If I went to this career woman, this grown woman sitting next to me, if I came up from behind you unexpectedly. You know, I wanted to touch on that part because it was very telling that Lucy brought that up specifically because – you know, that to me is a very smelling someone's hair, a partner, whatever. That's a very intimate moment. You know, to me, you know, like, you know, Latinas, especially like the hair is always smelling good. It coordinates with the perfume. It's colorful. You know, it's it's ready to roll. You know, so to me that you're absolutely right. Like people saying that was innocent. And I'm like, where I come from, when you're you, you don't you, go around smelling people's you, hair. You smell a woman's hair. You better you, you she better want you to do that because that's a very in, to me. That's an intimate moment. Yeah. You know, so I think the bottom line is. It wouldn't be cool if I did it. It wouldn't be cool um, if, if most men did it in any social setting. And if that's not how you feel, you really need to think about, you know, these lines. Because, again, it's not that we're, we're saying we have to never touch each other and we can't, you know, embrace ever again. But the bottom line is we have to respect people's space. And if you, if you are a woman in a position where, because I'll tell you a quick story that this brought to mind a, a moment that years and years ago, I don't want anyone to speculate what this is about, but many years ago, I remember... Uh, working with a much older person, a man that kind of did something somewhat similar with a female coworker, like again, kind of like a grandfatherly figure, and like just a brief touch on the shoulders for a quick moment, like, and then, but then, and so I, I contacted her and said, "Oh, we used to work together many years ago. You know, I remember this moment that was somewhat similar. Was that okay? I should have. I, I didn't feel comfortable saying anything. You seemed okay." She goes, "You know, I'll be honest with you." She goes, at that moment, I didn't think anything of it because of the nature of a relationship. It was kind of like a grandfatherly kind of moment, and she felt it was innocent. But she goes, if I didn't feel that way, I would have had every right to. And so that's kind of the point, right, is that you, when you have those kind of, uh, these kind of moments that, if it, you know, everyone has the right to their own opinion, their own personal space. And everybody just should just feel empowered enough to talk, to speak up. There should be something set up. If you work at an organization, there should be, you know, somewhere where you could go and talk about it. Like, I'm not okay with this and not feel retaliation because of it. That's right. That's right. And this isn't about like a a witch hunt, you know, talking about the political ramifications of this. You know, and Lucy's been saying this. I think even people that have been the most critical of Vice President Biden on this piece, and there's plenty of evidence that he, this is not the first time. He even said, I didn't feel like it was sexual harassment. I yeah. didn't feel like he invaded my personal space. Right. And he's like, well, if it happened, I didn't mean it to happen. I'm open to listen. So he's not like completely denying that it happened. Yes. But he also isn't apologizing because he's no. like, I had no ill intent. And so this is an interesting dynamic because this is happening a lot in our politics when it relates to race relations and immigration it's like well you know it's a you know you can't call like uh someone that's supporting the separate family separation policies or massive conversations or african americans well i'm not racist i just have these views you should respect my views it's like well your actions speak louder than words Mm -hmm. so even if there wasn't an intention you should if if, the effects of it are still there yeah so why wouldn't you if i insulted you on on but you know, in it not with that intention. But if you express that, the first thing I would say is, of course, I apologize. This has come up a lot in these conversations where you know, seeing how like the elite white people of America that are part of this media political circles like are sort of protecting him, and they don't even feel the obligation. And look, I think her age and the fact she's a Latina from the Southwest, and I, I know you read about her incredible story from being a gang member to going to law school to her career. Like, they don't feel the need to have the same respect for her. I mean, I'm sorry. If she was a white woman and went to Yale and was part of these elite circles, there would have been a whole different 
vibe on this conversation. Some people probably feel like you should just be grateful you're even here. We even allowed you in. Yeah, it's Uncle Joe. No importa. that will find him. That's how you feel about him. And look, I like Joe Biden, you know, and I, I have a lot of people in my family that are already supporting him and assuming he's going to run. And I, I'm the first to say that you should run. Let the voters decide how they feel about this issue. How but, do you feel like this will impact Biden's chances in the Democratic primary? I don't think ultimately, to be honest with you, this particular issue is going to impact him a lot. I think we already know what hits are coming. You know, the Anita Hill issue in the 80s or I guess early 90s, whatever that was. You know, that that was a more historic moment that had more of a Me Too flavor. And he was the front center of that. And that was within the political. That wasn't like a moment in the back of a stage. That was, you know, sort of a historical moment in our country. A lot of the issues that, you know, the question for Joe Biden is, you know, this is, you know, can can someone from the 80s lead us in 2020? Because as 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 a uh, overall as good a career as this man had, he's had some hiccups, uh, for sure. But a guy that you know generally you know is is respected across both sides of the aisle, and you know is a likable person. People feel like he has a certain gravitas and strength to run against Trump. But he is old school in every single way in terms of how he thinks about politics, how he thinks about Washington. He's going to make these slip ups. He's not a social media person, so I think it speaks to the bigger issue. I think he has a handled it well. He still hasn't come out and run. And yeah, and he's kind of you know hand, you know this is like if this is tripping you up before you even got out the brakes, I don't think that speaks well to sort of his overall um, chances. But we'll see how it goes. Dionelli, when we come back, we're really excited because when we come back, Dionelli, we're going to decode AOC, her latest appearance at the National Action Network. I Both- love her. But before we get to that, who doesn't here at Raise Latino Talk Podcast? Before we get to that, so I queue up the music, let people know where they can follow you on social media, and shout out all the different platforms that we're on. This is very exciting today. Mine is Did Inspire on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. We come back. We're going to decode AOC at the National Action Network Conference. LP 106.5 FM in Philadelphia and Raise Latino Talk podcast. Listen to 106.5 FM in Philly at phillycam.org forward slash listen and on the on the tune in app. And you could download Raise Latino Talk podcast on iTunes and anywhere you can download a podcast. Want to shout out our listener of the week. Amanda Gonzalez is a communications professional in South Jersey and our new biggest fan. She loves the show, loves my, especially the co-hosts, all these powerful women I bring to the table, Dionelli, Yasira, Chrissy, the whole crew. But she says the only criticism she has is I talk too much during the intros. So let's move on very quickly to the next segment. (laughs) It's time for the hottest segment of the show, Decoding AOC, where we analyze her speeches so you all can understand all the brilliant Latina millennial fabulousness. Oh, yes. So let's get to it. We'll play snippets of AOC's latest appearance at the National Action Network Conference, a convening of African-American leaders. This is Al Sharpton's organization. Are you ready Dionelli. Absolutely. All right, let's Dali. check let's check out let's check out let's check out this first clip and I'll get Dionelli's reaction. Thank you everybody. I'm proud to be a bartender. Ain't nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with working retail, folding clothes for other people to buy. There is nothing wrong with preparing the food that your neighbors will eat. There is nothing on, wrong girl. with driving the buses that take your family to work. There is nothing wrong with being a working person in the United States of America. And there is everything dignified about it. Dionelli. I love it. I love her. She's amazing. And she's speaking straight facts. It's all true. There's nothing wrong with it. There is such a... I mean, and then there's a racial component to this, right? But there's such a lack of 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 support and for working people in this country. Just think about how, you know, we we the, you know you can joke about um, you know uh, a domestic worker, you can you can talk down about a labor. Think about how, and I think I mean obviously. As a Dominican, as an immigrant, you can relate to this. I mean, Dominicans are the biggest hustlers, cab drivers, bodegueros, you know, the women. The, I just think about all the hotels, you know, all the restaurants that are Dominicanas, the small businesses you guys start, the belleza. Entrepreneurial, claro. Entrepreneurial, but then like that, how that's 
That's supposed to be what America's all about. Yes. And out, instead of honoring those people, say, wow, they came here with nothing. They, they came here and learned the language. They busting. How many of my Dominican buddies that their moms and dads in New York, I mean, just I mean, did the hardest labor, and they, they, they made children that were great successes, doing so much for this country, paying so many taxes for this country. And, and in general, I mean, that's resonated because how it was amazing to me listening to it, thinking about how little Democrat or Republican we hear our leaders just honoring working people. Addressing them. Absolutely. It's incredible. And you know what? I love when she said that there's nothing there ain't nothing wrong with being a bartender because that reminded me of a couple of gaslighters in my life. When I was in college, I bartended. Mm-hmm. And that's something that they will always bring up. Like you that's all you're ever gonna be. You just always you're just a piece of crap bartender. Like they will always try to break down my self esteem and they completely they were, I was like, there's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong with that? That's a job. It's a dignified job. Like, what do you think? Drinks are going to serve themselves. But it was just, like, all about just breaking down my self-esteem and just making me feel like I wasn't going to be nothing without them. And they knew that I something, a vocation that I have is to be on radio mm-hmm. and to empower people. And they just told me, you're never going to be able to do that. All you are is this and that. It would just always break me down. So I love that she said that. You know, I want to get back to that. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez actually has a, a, another clip in a second that gets right into that conversation. That's a very important point, so let's, let's definitely get back to it. But I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to just touch on the fact there was a controversy, or, or they tried to make it a controversy, mm-hmm. that, you know, this Latina gets in front of a black audience, she's got a little swag with her voice. They called it a Southern draw. That, to me, was more like an urban mm-hmm. vibe. And, that's, you know, and the bottom line is this, is that, if, if, if African-Americans had a problem with the way she was addressing them, speaking about their issues, this woman who felt very comfortable in that environment, they weren't criticizing her. They were saying, go on, girl. And, and you know, they were feeling very warm with her. If they had a problem with it, they'll talk to us Puerto Ricans and Latinos about it. OK, we don't exactly. need people outside our communities. That's try to understand cultural our the cultural the connection we have African-Americans. And that's the thing about gaslighters is they use something that's one of the tactics they use is called triangulation so if it's in personal relationships they will use um, play one person against the other so you know it's kind of just they break so they break down them each other instead of them doing it they do the job for them they play one person against the other but then in like over society if it's gaslighting over society they play one group of people against another group of people so one um nationality or one you know one culture against another culture you know and there and, and again the the especially the republican party but in general the 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 political class and we're talking about decades now has used this narrative around working people against us right so like when i was a little kid uh, being a, a a construction worker being an auto worker being like a work like a working person there was so much honor to it partially because that was a big chunk of the white man labor force Mm -hmm. and they were unionized and they had good benefits. I remember my grandfather grew up, I mean, he had his house at ninth and Erie, ninth and rising sun. And there was, there was a factory like three blocks down the block. He could make a good living. And so now that the, the, that we've, we've uh, de-unionized and we very much have, have delegitimized and uh, blue collar work in this country. Also it's not coincidence that that work is now being done by more women and minorities. Mm -hmm. You know, so so now that it's it's not a it's now it's a diverse set of people in those professions. All of a sudden, now they don't pay as well. The they benefits look, aren't as good. Down, they're they're that are looked down upon. You know, and I mean, think about the hassle. Think about the struggles. Teachers, these are educated people, are having mm-hmm. in this country getting. And by the way, eighty eighty five percent of our teachers are women. So is it really? I mean, you see a correlation here. A story. I want to get back to that piece around dreams. This next clip speaks to that perfectly. Let's give us a second. You're decoding AOC here on Race Talk Show. <laughs> I, in fact, am encouraged when people remind the country of my past, not because of anything about my story, but because it communicates that if I could work in a restaurant and become a member of the United States Congress, so can you. <laughs> Dionelli, you and Alexandria are on the same page. Exactly. It doesn't matter. And even it doesn't matter where you were. It's about where you're going, where you are and where you're going. Mm -hmm. And you learn so much when you're doing these kinds of jobs, serving other people, being on time, um, speaking. People skills. People People skills. 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 That's absolutely important. Bartenders are psychologists half the time. Yes. Ya tu sabe. Give me a story. Give me a story where, where you broke somebody down while you were bartending back. I know. They 
There's too many. That's the next book. That's the next book. That's the next book for Dionelli Reyes. So she's she's the bartender tales. But you know that's so important. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, you know, just send me a. I have to get a trademark before you steal it. But the but that's so important. And you talked. You just talked about this. Is that you know Alexandria? She's hitting it on the point because it isn't. It is about her. It's not about her, right? Because obviously she's a a special persona and history's brought her to this moment to be a vessel for a lot of people, particularly women in this time period to speak our truth. Right. But the bottom line is that, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't it, you know, and this is again, my frustrated with, with the haters with her and with our, this movement that we're a part of is that what else was she supposed to do? She grew up poor. She's not making excuse for that. She busted her butt. Her parents busted her butt. Her family to get education. She's not taking that education to make a, bun- a ton of money. She has an economics degree from a major university. She didn't have parents buy her into yeah, college. Yeah, She could work on Wall Street and make uh, six, multi-six figures and, and never hear from anyone and, and never give anyone a penny. But she goes back to her community, is serving her community in, in Congress. And, and so I guess my question is, if you're hating on that, what are we supposed to do? When we're lazy, we don't do nothing. We don't, we don't assimilate. We're accused of not contributing to the society. So which way is it? Oh, you can. They want us to be weak. Like gaslighters want you to feel like you're weak. Gaslighters want you to feel like you need them. You need, like they want to be the only source of power. They don't want us to empower ourselves. And I think you're hitting on a good point because there's one thing, and this is so insidious and it happens particularly in our communities because – so many people are taught they can't have and they feel like, you know, it's interesting because I even go through it. Right. Because even people that are a little more mature, uh, like myself, like they're taught, like after a while, don't even dream anymore. There's no point to it. And I really push back on that because I'm like, if you don't have your dreams, what do you got? You know, regardless. And, and to your point earlier, I think it's so important, Dionelli, if you can highlight this some more, is that that gaslighting syndrome, like there's a lot of people living with with someone or has someone in their life that's that's spewing that hate around stunning their dreams you're doing okay just stay there because i think on some level they don't feel the confidence to pursue their dreams they're they feel insecure gaslighters are extremely insecure people where they feel like they can't have people who are empowered around them they need to break down their self-esteem they have so much inner hate and they just project it upon other people and the thing is they want to break down other people's self-esteem other people's self-worth they undermine their accomplishments they their goals and their abilities because they want them to feel like they deserve the abuse that they're getting hmm. Danelli's yeah. spitting some knowledge here let me Thank tell you, you let me let's get back to uh, our last clip here for AOC and get Danelli's thoughts on it we need to do in radically deep problems is propose radically visionary solutions. Mm. Because radical doesn't mean crazy. Radical means addressing the root, addressing the rot. Mm. And that is why we have proposed a Green New Deal for the future of America. That is why within that legislation and rather within that that resolution, we do not shy away from bold conversations of health care, housing and education as human rights, of living wages and dignified work, of policy that isn't just drafted with the next election in mind, but also with the next generation in mind. Dionelli powerful she's speaking the truth and that's the thing about gaslighters they don't want people to know the truth they don't want the people to understand the power that they have within themselves and the fact that there's power in numbers and you got to come together the enemy we're not the enemy we got to come together you know what's so interesting because when we think about you see it on social media you know the trump supporters and that's a whole other conversation but that you know basically there's just so much anger and I think they've they've gotten caught up in this in this sickness and it's racism and it's xenophobia and it's insecure. ultimately it's this big insecurity and this fear about something in their systematic. life, you know, and, and they're so angry. And I look at this video and this woman is vilified. This woman gets threatened. And again, I have some, you know, I have some contacts in her in her larger circle. I mean, you know, the corazón, we're worried about this woman. You know, I mean, this woman sí. has to be protected. I mean, I mean, she gets threats all the time, many of which you never even hear about. Mm-hmm. And so I think about. After all of that hate, all this, the, 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 the pile on, look how optimistic she is. Mm-hmm. Look how happy she is. You know, she's a Latina speaking in front of a group of African-Americans, older people. You would think, oh, you know, they should feel beat down. But it's actually the opposite. 
the people in that room are there's a happiness there because it is about in, in inclusivity. You know, she said something on Twitter the other day, which was, and I kind of say this in, in other ways and other mo- moods that, that, you know, she goes, even though y'all hate me, I'm still going to fight for your health care. You know, the other yes. side, these other people. And that's absolutely right. Because, you know, what we're talking, we're not talking about health care just for the sick people that are our friends. Mm. You know, that coal miner in West Virginia, that person that blames minorities and blames somebody else for their problems and follows this guy just because on some way he feels like he represents him. Like, but you know, we don't want those people screwed over either. You know, so there's a certain happiness to it. And the other thing I wanted to say really quickly on this is that, um, is that, is that, you know, the other thing which she spoke about politically, which is so critical, is that we have to deal with the root of our problems. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, especially when it deals with issues of people of color, our government is very like, deal with it on the back end. You know, so, well, we have, we have a drug issue. Instead of, you know, trying to deal with the root of it and, and, and approach why we have such a, an addiction to uh, drugs in this Opioid. country, opioids or drug, you know, we just have this, you know, why is this country so over medicated, right? Instead of dealing with that, we, we deal with, okay, let's lock them up. Let's close now, the border. No, now, let's now punish have, people. It's a, it's called an opioid epidemic because it affects Caucasians. But back in the eighties and nineties, when crack was affecting uh, the Latino and black community, what did they do? They just put us in jail. That's right. That's right. Interesting how, how the, the, the framework changes when other people are impacted. AOC, and, keep doing your thing. And something that I love about AOC, how you said that she was she's still being positive and uplifting, even though there's so much hate coming at her. She's living out the quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So it doesn't matter how much hate you're getting. It doesn't matter. You still got to project that love that you have inside you and don't let people damage you. You got to rise above it. Absolutely right. The beautiful thing about AOC is that she's bringing, she is a vessel for talented millennial Latinas and other people that have not been hurt in our country like Dionelli Reyes. Mm -hmm. Join here with my co-host today, Dionelli Reyes on Race Talk Show. We'll be right back. You're listening to WPPM LP 106.5 FM in Philadelphia. And you are listening to the What's Next radio show and Raise Latino Talk podcast. Excited to share that the Love Should and Her campaign to support domestic violence survivors are, are debuting their Break the Silence short film on Sunday, April 28th at 3 p.m. at Aspira Education Campus, located at 6301 North 2nd Street in Philadelphia. Support Love Shouldn't Hurt and listen to the story of the three amazing women featured in this powerful video testimonial. Thank you, Dionelli. And to keep supporting Love Shouldn't Hurt, we're going to keep stacking 20s on our presidential election segment. Ray, California Congressman Eric Swalwell announced his candidacy on the Colbert, Colbert Show. Colbert, Colbert. <laughs> Colbert. Colbert. Habla okay. francés, mujer. Es, Usted es, es español. Es, entiende es, es, el idioma francés. Canada. <laughs> who is Eric Swal- who is Eric Swalwell and why does he think he can win all of these other candidates already declared you know if he had there Eric Swal was a good guy Eric Swal was a, co- a congressman in California he's gotten a lot of attention in sort of the progressive circles because he's one of the uh he's on these judiciary committees he's a former lawyer so he speaks a lot about the Russian investigations and he's really good in media talking about Trump and and some of these media things he also is um, I think he's making a policy argument because his big issue is, is going to be gun control. And I know you have an interest in that. And also he's got a, a political argument because he's from California. So obviously California is going to be a big primary state. We've talked about that. People don't realize California is going to make a, a huge difference in this primary election because of the way they changed the calendar. You heard it here first, <laughs> by the way. And everyone, all the people on mainstream media are going to say this in a year. You heard it here now. Um, but also he's from Iowa originally. Mm. So he's the only one that can say with the people in Iowa, yo soy de aquí, and with California people, I'm here too. So that's his campaign. And I think it also is a sign that people think in the Democratic circles that Biden is weak because they're kind of attracting that same vibe. Mm -hmm. You know, that middle America white guy, but he's progressive enough to attract people of color, younger people. So good guy. I wish he was running for Senate in Iowa. We could use him doing that, but he's got a shot like everybody else. So his big issue is gun control. Do you think that gives him an advantage? Especially with young voters? You know, I I think it does. I think Eric, you know, Swal- he's a good candidate. You know, I think he, um, I think it's really important that somebody is bringing that issue to the table because, you know, oftentimes we talk a good game, but then when it comes down to it, elected officials 
put the youth issues to the side because they figure out oh, they're not going to vote like the older people and they kind of focus on issues for another generation. So I'm glad it's being brought up in the debates. And then the Democratic primary, we need to get these people on the record. Like, what are you really going to do? What are you really going to push? Mm-hmm. And how are you going to prioritize gun control? And how are you going to deal with these Republicans? Because they are so in the pocket of the gun lobby. It's ridiculous. So I'm glad he's bringing it up. It's hard to win as a one-issue candidate. But I'm glad he's going to bring that to the table. And so, you know, I wanted to ask you, Dan Ellie, we haven't talked much about your uh, thoughts about the primary so far. So what do you, what's your initial thoughts? What do you want to hear the candidates talk more about? The debate starting in a few months. The first one's in Miami, by the way. Hope I can get a ticket. Uh, that will be nice in June. I know I have a few friends there for sure, but what do you want to hear at that first debate? What do you want to hear these candidates talking about? I want them to talk, uh, to talk more about immigration, women's rights, such as like equal pay for equal work, reparations, and okay. empower inner city community. You know, the reparations is going to be a really interesting conversation because it... I heard one guy talk about it. Well, uh, Booker's actually... A few have talked about it. Booker has put a bill in in the Senate, which mm-hmm. is sort of interesting timing, right? Political. And it is... Um, the, 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 the bottom line is that it's a conversation we've never really had because beyond the issue of, you know, do you write African American... You know, the... the 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 op, the policy details of that do you you know are you writing African Americans little checks or how are you rec, rec, you know rec, reimbursing or you know taking care of people um, to acknowledge that issue but we've never really have had a we've talked about race but we've never had a really how would you say uh, uh, a, a a come to Jesus moment as a country to really talk about how race impacted our societies you know South Africa had that many years ago and um, you know kind of really kind of breaking down okay clean slate but we gotta we gotta we gotta work these wounds so it's the most important thing with that conversation is that we have to acknowledge there have to be times there has to be some policies that directly impact the black community you know obama bent backwards not to be too black um and you know obviously the affordable care act and other things he did benefit the african-american community tremendously but the reality is you know there wasn't a lot of substantive policy that was that put a lot of resources directly into the black community so we, we can't have that again with our next Democratic president. And I think, you know what, our community, uh, we're we're more woke now. We're waking up finally. And we're like, no, we're our rights aren't something that, oh, it'll be a nice to have. No, we deserve these rights as human beings. We deserve these rights, especially after um, when Nipsey Hussle passed away. That's right. Like that, cre- that created a huge impact in the community. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy to support the Love Hood Shirt and Hurt movement. You know, these Democratic candidates are going to make me broke. I don't know if I can go on vacation this summer of 10, 15 <laughs> more, declare, but we're just joking around. Chrissy Vega from the Love Shirt and Hurt movement, we're very happy to be supporting you. Absolutely. You know, uh, Dinelli, let people know where they can find you on social media before I queue up the end. Did Inspire, D I D I N S P I R E, on Instagram, Facebook, and on YouTube. We come back, Dinelli. Gaslighting, okay. Our latest segment on Race Talk Show. You're listening to WPPM LP Philadelphia 106.5 FM in Philadelphia, Philly Camp, hashtag People Power Media. On the last segment of the show, we are debuting Dianelis' Gaslighting, okay, segment where she breaks down if we are getting gaslighted or what. This week, I'll play some sound from Attorney General Bill Barr's testimony on Capitol Hill this week. And Dionelli will let us know what's going on. As I cue this up, why don't you share with the people again, what is gaslighting, Dionelli? And what what would you like people to learn from this segment, this regular segment of the show? And and do you like the name of the segment? I do like the name of the segment. Okay, well, feel free to change it. That was just my initial attempt. But let people know a little bit about gaslighting as I cue up the audio for you. So... The term gaslighting originates from the 1938 Patrick Hamilton play Gaslight in its 1940-1944 film adaptations where the husband gradually made his wife believe she is insane so he could steal from her. He isolated her from everyone and began to manipulate the lighting in their home. So, And then when the wife would ask him if he noticed the difference in the lighting, he would deny it and tell her she was imagining it. So it's an insidious form of psychological manipulation where in the end you end up doubting your sanity and then you have to rely on your gaslighter for any, you know, any form of reality. 
And Dunelli, where do you where do you see this? Where is this commonly seen in personal relationships? It could be, you know, it could be in a ro- romantic relationship. It could be in your family. You could be ba- gaslighted by a parent, uh, sibling, just someone that has influence in your life. And also in the workplace, it could be over society. So. You know, not everything that happens or any kind of uh, miscommunication is gaslighting. Gaslighting is done like if the gaslighter has uh, an intent in mind, like an agenda to manipulate and control the target. But the thing about gaslighting is once you find out what it is and you realize this person's gaslighting me, then the gaslighter loses power. So this is why it's so important to uh, raise awareness about the situation because when I realized that I was being gaslighted, I'm like, what? Because for the longest time, when you're being gaslighted, you think that you must be the issue. But no, it's not. <laughs> Talk about the clip. But Bill Barr, the Attorney General Bill Barr this week, went on Capitol Hill for a few different hearings, and he talked about how there may have been spying in the presidential election. Then when they said, well, what do you mean by spying? Well, I don't have any proof of that, but I'm going to look into that. Um, you know, this kind of double talk, Dionelli, is this, what What? What? What would you characterize as gaslighting, double talk? What, what is it? Well, the thing about gaslighters is that they have something called in the like in the narcissistic abuse survivor community is something called flying monkeys. So the terminology flying monkeys comes from the Wizard of Oz, where the wicked witch sends the flying monkeys to torment her targets. So the uh, the flying monkeys, they do the dirty work for the gaslighter. So Mm. they are like ride or die for this person. So and there's two types of flying monkeys. There's a there's the one that's naive that they don't realize, no, that doesn't really happen. Not really. Oh, they're, they're a nice person. But then there's another one that's toxic, just like the gaslighter, and they probably want something from the gaslighter. Maybe they want to secure a job or they want money or, you know, different things. But they seem and they act a little bit. They act like the gaslighter where you ask them a question and they don't give you a direct answer. And they're just like... They have like a circular conversation where you don't really get anywhere with them. And then you ask them a question, they bring up something else. They use inflammatory words or comments to kind of just distract you. And it's like, it's just, it was it's amazing to me when I was watching that. Yeah, no, and, and Attorney General Barr, it's such, it, you hit on some of the symptoms, right? Because when I think of any of these elected officials or, you know, these these top officials speaking at these congressional hearings, I think of very, especially the lawyers, especially the top lawyer in America, the law enforcement lawyer in America, very uh, crisp language, very they know, very uh, exact language, very clear language, and then he's like stuttering and saying, "Well, you can say that," and he's 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 having all this ambiguous kind of discussion. Like you said, he double talks. He says there was spying, and then when they call him out on it, he sort of retracts some of that statement. So. Um, I think there's definitely some clear examples of that. The problem is this isn't this isn't like even not that personal relationships aren't important, but this is this is the rule of law in our country. It's very concerning. Absolutely. And the fact that he used that terminology spying is such an inflammatory word. And then he like uh, took a few steps back. And when they asked him, well, is there proof of it? Oh, well, there's no actual proof. But uh, what I kind of meant was that it was maybe uh, unauthorized surveillance. It's like, but you already said spying. So now the people who are part of that or that circle, now they're going to be saying spying, spying, spying. Yeah, it's like Trump got his headline. What, you know, it's interesting because Bill Barr is someone that, you know, certainly I'm not down with him in the political sense, but this is someone that had a celebrated career. He was a former attorney general back in the days. And, you know, he had no reason to sort of put his reputation on the line. So what do you see the dynamics? Like he's really sort of ruining his legacy in front of our eyes at this stage in his life. So, is that something – what do you think is, is – is, what, what's the psychology of someone that would be willing to do this to himself at this stage of his life for, you know, for Trump of all people? Well, he sees the – how powerful Trump is, and then he may feel like he will be powerless without being connected to him. So it's about, like, the – also the self-esteem. A lot of the, like, the flying monkeys. I'm not saying that he's 100% a flying monkey, but they have low self-esteem. Maybe 78. (laughs) (laughs) 
So they feel like the own that source of they need that source of power and that connection. He's maybe afraid of what he would lose if he was to go against them. Do you think he's trying to because he has a report he's got to eventually let out and he's delaying, delaying. He'll and probably, then Easter's coming. Yeah. So a lot of them will be off. So he's buying himself time. But so, in the end, the thing about it, the en- in the end, the truth always comes out. That's right. That's right. So I'm hoping that once that report comes out, uh, somebody gets their hands to the unredacted version and can leak it for us. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, what, what do you do you see that in the work you're doing, counseling people on gaslighting this delay tactic? Because that's what Trump does. Right. He he delays. I don't give out my taxes. I delay, delay. I listen to uh, uh, what would you say? Uh, subpoenas about information they delay delay bars delaying yes. is that a common occurrence that you see these dynamics absolutely they delay and deny delay and deny delay deny lie and it's just all about just they don't want the truth to come out so any tactic that they could use to not allow the truth to come out they'll use it and think nothing of it so it's it's gaslighting and he's a monkey bar is a monkey Lying. that's I'm not saying that. He's a flying not monkey. Not 100%, but there's hints of being like He's flying monkey-ish. Monkey. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a... There's hints of it. He's there's a jumping monkey. Well, anyway, but when okay. I was watching that, I'm like, wow. Wow, no question about it. Dinelli said, well, we're wrapping up this episode of Race Talk Show. And again, we really appreciate you coming back as a co-host. Um, people, I'm, I'm really curious to see the comments. Uh, people really enjoy your presence on the show. you got a lot going on. Let people know about the book and also... Well, this is not the only radio program you're making appearances on. You're uh, no. you're uh, very uh, you're very you're 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 growing quite a platform here in, in the radio industry. And I, I appreciate that. I'm telling you, it's like the vocation. Like, I, like I read the book called Mastery by Robert Greene, and it's like sometimes your purpose in life is not something that you run after; it's something that gravitates to you. And this mm. is something that that gravitates, and I appreciate it so much. So yes, my, the book is called Delayed, but not the Night Three, and you could. S- See or get the link for it on my social media, Did Inspire, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I'm also on La Chelcha radio TV show as well. So, again, you could see that on my social media. Yeah, just, just follow Dianelli Reyes. She'll, uh, she'll, you'll definitely catch her. That's on Friday nights, right? That show? Sí, so, like, you got like a back to back here. When you're getting ready to go out, you know, you could turn that on. Yes, so it's more like uh, about what's going on and the entertainment is in Spanish. It's yeah. in Espanol. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, no, it's definitely a good, like, when you get ready to go to the club, kind of have it in the background, mm-hmm. listen to your vibe, listen to the oh, music. Yeah. It's got a good vibe to it, no question about it. The only the other thing I wanted to mention to you, and, and for those um, that are new to the experience or watch us more on the video platforms like Facebook Live and IG Live, but don't listen too much to the podcast, we have, or listening to us on WPPM Radio, 106.5 FM, we actually had an, a podcast audio version episode earlier in the week where my brother, who's also a pretty well-known hip-hop artist himself, Planetary from Out of of Space and Army of the Pharaohs crew, if you're down with Jedi Mind Tricks, you probably heard my brother rhyme over the years. So he he gave us his breakdown on the legacy of Nipsey Hussle. Much respect. I did notice that you were very touched by his loss as well. Absolutely, because he was so powerful and he was so empowering to the community. And he was all about, you know, um, the, like, like the rising of the phoenix you know what i mean it's about being resilient it doesn't matter where you were it's about where you're going so the rest of peace nipsey hustle if you want to hear more about that listen to the uh about nipsey's legacy listen to the uh, uh episode that we released earlier this week and again thank you so much for listening to the what's next radio show here at wppm people power media retrospect our executive director as we used to say down the way hanging in the cut Maria, vanessa maria graber much respect to you thank you so much without you we wouldn't be here and I'd be I'd be doing this show as a podcast very quietly in my basement <laughs> so my kids wouldn't fall asleep. So Aww. thank you for letting me be loud like I am. Thank you, Dean Lilly, for joining us. Thank really you appreciate for you. Having me. I appreciate it. No, the the, the the streets the streets are asking for it. We definitely want to <laughs> continue to support you. I mean, yeah, people are making moves. Delilah D's now, I mean, is on the radio now. I mean, people come here and they blow up. It's incredible. So thank you so much for joining us, family, on social media and have a wonderful night. <laughs>